Coming up on the Sark Fighter podcast. I got a phone call that uh, Monday morning from a primary's uh, nurse, and she said, everything you just described to me, you need to be in the emergency room right now. Jack Bepley's experience is so similar to my own. A very active man in his early 60s, suddenly without the power to go. And after that cardiac MRI, they sort of had an idea that maybe it was sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis struck Jack's heart, and he didn't see it coming. And in the in the room talking to a nurse, the next thing you know, there's four more nurses flying in the room, and they're saying, we got to go to ICU. I'm like, what? This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hello and welcome. This is episode 60 of the Sark Fighter podcast, brought to you in part by a grant from ATAR Pharma. Hi guys, I do this podcast to offer fellow Sark fighters hope and to help you connect with other Sark patients to hear their stories, understand how Sark affects their lives, and hopefully that helps you understand what you're up against, what you need to overcome, whether it's the disease or, as in the case of Jack Bepley, who we'll hear from here in just a little bit, the side effects of the medicine or perhaps, unfortunately, both. And today we will be hearing from Sark fighter Jack Bepley of Chicago. And and I just got to tell you that after I told my wife about Jack's case and his life, she said, John, that's almost like interviewing yourself. And she's kind of right. Jack has sarcoidosis in his heart, which I do not have, but it's caused him some serious setbacks and it has changed his life for the worse. In addition to being on the verge of what we would call in layman's terms, a heart attack, it has put him in a place where he can no longer do what he wants and at the level he wants. It's life-threatening and it's life-changing. And I know from personal experience how difficult that can be to handle. Now, I just have to draw a couple of these parallels. This is about Jack. It's not about me. But um, if you've listened, you know that I was once a marathon runner good enough to qualify for the Boston Marathon. So was Jack. He is also a cyclist who in the summer rides his bike or did over 100 miles a week, which is also my goal. Uh, and and often I have accomplished that, but my life is much different post-sarcoidosis. And I haven't talked a whole lot on this podcast about fishing, but it is one of my true loves. And years ago, in the early 90s, I took three week-long 100-mile-plus canoe trips in a remote spot in the Canadian wilderness. Now, this is a spot that most people have never heard of, even within the fishing community. And Jack and I, as it turns out, Jack has gone there for some 20 years in a row, the same spot. Even when sarcoidosis made this trip perhaps not the best idea. It's remote. There's no communication. You travel great distances. It is physically taxing. And Jack went anyway. And it's kind of on my bucket list to maybe go back there someday. And I never, ever thought that I would or could. And I still don't think so. But now that door is open just a crack. But Jack and I stumbled onto this common love for this particular place during the interview. And honestly, I didn't see it coming. I didn't know about it. It did not appear in any of our communication or discussions prior to recording the interview. And I just couldn't believe that we also had that in common. So if there is a sarcoidosis case that I can totally relate to, it is Jack's. And the interview with him is coming up in just a couple of minutes. But first, let me remind you that April is Sarcoidosis Awareness Month, and we're still right here in April of 2022. Uh, And it's important that those of us who are suffering with sarcoidosis let the world know that we exist and that this condition exists. And the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is making that about as easy as they possibly can. They've got a toolkit out there. There's a link in the show notes that gives you an opportunity to 
kind of let people know that you have sarcoidosis, let people know what it is, let the world know that there is such a thing as sarcoidosis, because you always have to say it slowly so people understand. But the more we can make this top of mind for our friends and for other people, and in particular for the medical community, the more likely it is that we can speed the diagnosis, that we can speed the research for drugs that uh, can replace prednisone and maybe some of these terrible drugs that you'll hear Jack talk about in the cardiac community that were giving him such a problem. Um, Because at some point when you have a problem, for instance, like with Jack, with your heart, you then get medications that are heart-related as opposed to being specifically sarcoidosis-related, and those also have problems. But let's just hope that we can advance the cause all the way around. So April is the found is the month that the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research throws everything at raising awareness, and they are asking all of us who are afflicted to help them lift that bar or get over that hurdle or use whatever metaphor you want to 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 let people know. Now and and towards that end, I want to thank a couple of my colleagues at WSLS 10, where I work, it's the NBC station, NBC station here in Roanoke, Virginia. I'm the news anchor there. But our chief meteorologist, Jeff Hanowich, my co-anchor, Rachel Lucas, and sports director, John Apicello, all joined me in wearing purple on World Sarcoidosis Day. Now, the guys wore purple ties. Rachel actually wore a purple dress, but we took pictures in the studio, and I've posted them on my social media, including Instagram and Facebook. Maybe you want to go check out the pictures. Uh, All you have to do is follow me on my social media. It's The Sark Fighter on Instagram and Sark Fighter uh, on uh, Facebook. And, you know, follow along, look at the pictures, share the pictures, and then do the same thing with just find an excuse to use these hashtags that the foundation has come up with. There is a hashtag for the month, hashtag make it visible. Use that on all your social media posts related to sarcoidosis. And there are a couple of others. One is hashtag sarcoidosis awareness, and one is just hashtag sarcoidosis. But put it out there and let's amplify the message. And when you find the posts that the foundation has put out there, just share them. Share them to your story, as I've done on Instagram, uh, or share them to your page. Do whatever you can to help them get the message out. And they've done some very good, very clever uh, posts. Okay? So that's what's going on for Sarcoidosis Awareness Month. And now my interview with Jack Bepley of Chicago is coming up next here on the Sark Fighter Podcast. I feel like a zombie Just feeding at stumbling Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter Podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast. Welcome back to the Sark Fighter Podcast, and joining me now is Jack Bepley, who lives in Chicago, and he's a fellow Sark Fighter. Jack, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Glad you could have me. So you reached out to me after listening a little bit because uh, you have cardiac sarcoidosis. How did you first find out that something was not right with your heart? Um, Actually, it was the event itself. So three years ago, March... Um, I'm sitting on a couch and I could feel my, some palpitations going on and I put my hand on my chest and it felt like my heart was just rolling. So I asked my wife, can you, can you just check my pulse? So she did. That sounds, looks fine. Then she put her hand on my chest and she's like, we got to go to the emergency room now. Cause it was just doing all these flip-flops. She could tell. She could tell there was something wrong. And I'm like, ah, 
I've had palpitations before. I'm, I'm fine. I'm just going to play through. Um, and so I didn't do anything. That was a Friday. And I woke up the next morning and I was still off. So I took a baby aspirin. I sent a note to my primary uh, provider, realizing through the portal, realizing she would not see it or address it until Monday. And then that day we went for a long walk. We had friends over, smoked a cigar, had some wine. Sunday, we went for another long walk, came home, got on the rowing machine, rode for 45 minutes. And by rowing, I actually felt better. I got a phone call that uh, Monday morning from a primary's uh, nurse. And she said, everything you just described to me, you need to be in the emergency room right now. And I said, I don't want to go to the emergency room. So she made an appointment for uh, to see the primary and I saw her in the afternoon. And um, she took a EKG and she used this very technical term to, to, to tell me what she saw. It looks funky. I'm like, what does funky mean? Huh. So she's like, I think you need to go. I'm going to, I want you in the ED. I mean, right now. And the, her office was like a 20 minute ride from the, um, the hospital. And I'm like, I want to send you an ambulance, but you're not going to go. Are you? I'm like, no. So <laughs> I, I drove to the ED. They checked me in. They did another EKG. And when I got to the ED, they, they, fast line me. Usually you have to wait forever. I got right in. They did another EKG. They said something's funky. And then they brought in a a cardiac specialist. He said the same thing. So they kept me for observation. And the next day they, they uh, did a EKG and they said, based upon those results, we're either going to send you to a stress test or we're going to do an angio on you, uh, angiogram. Right. And I'm like, come on, bring on, <laughs> bring on the stress test because right. um, I, I work out quite a bit. My, my, um, I'm, I'm <laughs> losing the term, right. but all my, all my blood numbers come back great. Yeah. I mean, there's def- nothing wrong. A cholesterol, my cholesterol numbers are off the scale. Great. So mm-hmm. I'm, it was, I'm like, come on. I, and there's nothing wrong. So then they, um, decided they're working to do the stress test. They're going to do the angio. And I got someone asking me, are, are you ready to put, have stents put in your heart? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, sure, but you're not going to find anything. And so they, they bring me in, I do the angio and I come out of it and, you're, and they're like, yeah, you're right. There's, there was no, no blockage, nothing. I'm like, yeah, I told you that. Right. But we, <laughs> we still want to hold you. And now it's about four o'clock in the afternoon and my wife's been there all day and, I say, go home, go, go get some lunch, go take a shower, go feel better. And in the, in the room talking to a nurse, the next thing you know, there's four more nurses flying in the room and they're saying, we got to go to ICU. I'm like, what? We got to go to ICU now. Wait and a minute. Apparently- so you're feeling fine. They've done the angio. And, and just so I know, but the listeners don't know yet. But, but like you and I live in a parallel uh, lifestyle with respect to the way we work out. I mean, you would, you were biking 120 miles a week. You've done an, a half iron man. You are on your rower all the time. So you're not just like a, a kinder standard walking around fit guy. Fitness is your lifestyle. Absolutely. I right. mean, I, okay. it's, it's not only is it done for physically, but you probably can relate to this, that it's, it's a mental release. And so when you're doing, you're on your bike or you're working out all of a sudden you you're solving all the problems you're, tr- you're trying to, to work through. Yes. So, all right. so the nurses come rushing into the room, you're sitting up saying, okay, something's funky, but I'm killing it on all these tests and they keep accelerating the level of care. Right. And so all these nurses are running around me and I have one nurse just staring at me and I'm staring at her. And she goes, hello. And I say, hello back. And she jumps backwards. So apparently I found out later that when my, I think my heart rate was like 180, 200, two, I, to some, something very high. Mm-hmm. And apparently when it's, it's that um, high, you're, you're coding. And so they're not used to anybody being conscious when this happens. And so 
they're wheeling me down to ICU. I'm fully conscious of what's going on. They, they get me in there. They hook me up. It, they're pumping me full of all these, the, uh, the drugs to try to get the heart rate down. Am, amiodarone, they're just give me an IV of it. They're just trying to do this. Okay. And after about eight hours of my heart at this elevated rate, they come in and say, uh, we're going to have to shock you. I'm like, really? I, I'm like in the morning. No, now. <laughs> so I, I felt like, wow, this is real. All of a sudden this is real. So I, mm-hmm. my wife is with me and I'm like, I, I want her with me, but I'm like, that's selfish. I don't want her to see me be shocked. So I ask her, do you want to be here for this? And she's like, no. So she leaves the room and they give me um, a twilight drug and said, you won't remember anything. Uh huh. So when they hit me. I remember. <laughs> so, no way, really. So and this they, is to get your heart rhythm back into a normal range, right? It's a reset. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they were trying to reset my heart, and it it did. And um, it they said most people just when they after it happened, they, then the nurse said you did so well. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> I they said you didn't swear. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I. I, I got through that and um, it, they described it like being hit by a truck. And I said, I don't know what that means, but I played football and I feel like I just got hit by a professional linebacker and I didn't have any pads on. I mean, I just, I did, it just waxed the hell out of you. So, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and so the rest of the night, and when you're in ICU, you're, you're watching your monitors and um, I said, I said a prayer that night and I, and I said, I would never, ever, ever talk about it to anybody. And a few days later, we had someone visiting us, a good friend of ours, and she was on a spiritual journey long before I was. And she asked the one question where I had to tell what, it, what happened. And she asked, how does this change your relationship with God? And I looked at her and I'm like, I said, it didn't. I said, when I'm sitting there and I'm watching those monitors and I'm watching my heart trying to get back to where it was, this abnormal state, I said a prayer of thanks. I said, thank you for the great life I had. You know, please watch my over my wife. Please watch over my girls. I'm not the type of person to sit there and beg and plead. I just, so I, I said a prayer of thanks Mm -hmm. and because I was, I've been thankful for all the, you know, the great opportunities I've had. Sure. So, so the thing I said I would never talk about, I, t- I talked about, and I just, it's it's been a real journey since then. So, then the docs are trying to figure out what caused all this. So they went down the Lyme disease route. They um, did all these different things. I did a cardiac MRI. I don't know if you ever had to do one of those. Mm-mm. That's not one of those MRIs where you can just put in the to get in the tube. I fall asleep in those things. MRI. I do too. That doesn't bother me. <laughs> yeah. So they put me in, but you got to hold your breath um, throughout the test. So your chest isn't moving up and down. And so they can isolate what's going on with the chest. And after that cardiac MRI, they sort of had an idea that maybe it was sarcoidosis. So that was their working theory at that time. And they would not let me leave the hospital until I had an ICD um, and pacemaker installed in my chest. So from the time I entered the hospital, the time I left, it was eight days, went through all these tests. It wasn't until um, several weeks later that I actually did a PET scan and that was basically their confirmation that it it looks like sarcoidosis. As you probably know, they never can say it is sarcoidosis unless they do a biopsy, biopsy. And, they can, and they can actually confirm it. Well, PET's non-invasive, so um, they 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 figured out it it looks like. And so, where where in your heart, Jack? Is it on a valve or so? It's actually the way it was described to me. It's both on the inside and the ep- external of the heart. 
Okay. And that's the tricky part is the external part of the heart. Huh. The internal part of the heart, you, you can eventually address through ablation. But if it's all, also on the external part of the heart, the external ablation procedure is much different. They have to go underneath your rib cage and up and then break the sack around the heart, then try to do the ablation that way, which is a much, much more tricky operation. Yeah. But I, I went from being on no medications whatsoever to being on, I can't tell you how many pills. And, and one of the reasons I reached out to you is a lot of the folks talk about how the SARC meds just beat them up. And I've been fortunate. The, the methotrexate I'm on um, and the pregnisone I'm on, um, they really didn't beat me up too bad, but the cardiac meds just wailed on me. Really? Amiodarone, one of the side effects of amiodarone is um, sun. That if you get in the sun, you're, you, just, you just start burning up rather quickly. Like huh. I could literally on a sunny day walk across a, a sunny parking lot when my, mom, when my wife would pick me up from the train station and I'd be beet red. So it turned me into a vampire. <laughs> so, and you're an outdoors guy. Right. So I, nine o'clock in the morning to four o'clock in the afternoon, I just, I just stayed in the shadows or, and it just was just killed me. Just absolutely just, I wanted to be outside. And uh, now so are that, you, are you retired or what is, what is your job? Were you not, not working? What was going on then? So I, I'm still working. I um, work for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of Lean or Six Sigma, but that's sort of my gig. Basically, it's process improvement type of work. I go in okay. and, and look at things. Um, so, um, yeah, but in the summer months, I like to be outside. I love to fish um, and, and do all that stuff. So that was really a, a downer trying to get addressed to those drugs. And there's other drugs that they keep on wanting to slow your heart down. So lisinopril is one of them. It, it just slows everything down. And I was being lethargic and I'm like, this is not how I want to be. I just, I, and so that sort of started the journey towards getting off. How do I get off these cardiac meds? So they transitioned me about a year later to this drug called Sotolol, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't have any of the side effects of amiodarone, but it has different side effects, which is more lethargy. Oh, God. And I'm like, I can't do this. So <laughs> um, I started exploring ablation and my... Um, um, electrical cardiologist, he's done a bunch of ablations, but the fact that it might have, to be, might have to be both internal and external, he said, I want to give you to one of the, you know, refer you to one of the experts in the field to do this, right? because if it's external, I don't have experience doing that. Tell us all so, what ablation actually is. So my understanding, and I'm going to get this wrong and you get people <laughs> to okay, say I well, mess it up. I won't correct you. That's for sure. So it's basically the same approach as an angio. They come in through, you know, the, the leg. And mm -hmm. when they find a spot that um, they believe is SARC, mm -hmm. they try to poke it and figure out, is this causing the heart to go crazy or not? Yeah. And if it does, then they um, do some type of cauterization or some type of way to, to remove that tissue. The granuloma. Yes. Right. Okay. So, um, I talked to two different experts. One, one guy said, you just might have to live this way the rest of your life. And I talked to another guy. He's like, you're too young to be living like this. This is what we can do for you. And it was a very, it was, considered a high risk procedure, but I'm like, I can't continue to live like this. And like, and this is like, you can't pass a couch without taking a nap, right? With talking about the lethargy and all that. Um, it wasn't that bad, but for me not to be able to work out, it just, that was my release. That was mm -hmm. my, I, I needed to be able to work out. And if it just, it just 
beat me to the point I couldn't do anything. Got it. So I eventually did this ablation. And before you do the ablation, they, they stop you on all cardiac meds because they want the SARC to be active. So what does that mean when the SARC is active in the heart? That means you can go into VTAC. And so uh, two days before, <laughs> before the procedure, I'm off all cardiac meds. I'm sitting at my desk upstairs, my wife's downstairs, and my, div my device fires. And so I scream, and she comes running up, and she finds me basically in a fetal position um, because, you know, I went into VTAC. And so the, mm -hmm. the device did what it was supposed to do. It's, they, they've called an insurance policy, and it reset, you know, reset the heart. And so my, um, the guy doing the ablation is like, yeah, that's, we want your heart to be active so we can find it. And right. after he did the procedure, he came in and visited with me and he said, and he was, he was all amped up, all excited. He's like, we found five spots and we got them. And um, he's like, no more restrictions, no more cardiac meds. You can start going back and doing your, your normal activities. And we, they were in there for five hours. Wow. And they said, we still see stuff on the external part of the heart, but you know what? We had you under for five hours. Let's see what this does. And here I am a year later, I haven't had events. So, and I'm off cardiac meds, which is good. I'm working out again, but I always have to watch my heart rate because you don't want this little device to fire. <laughs> and you, so you still have the um, pacemaker. Is that, is that essentially what it is? Pacemaker and, and ICD. ICD, which is basically shocks your heart. Yes. If you have, so if that thing fires, that means you're having a lay person's term heart attack. Correct. And the technology in the ICDs is nothing but amazing. They can set the levels as to when it goes into pacing mode, um, when it will fire a warning to your heart to say, knock it off to, and then to the full reset. And um, the, it's just, just rather amazing. And the other thing about the, uh, the ablation is the device was pacing me to like 70% of the time. So instead of my heart working on its own, it, the device had to keep on helping it. And I'm like, that doesn't sound right to me. Um, and so after the ablation, I'm being paced less than 1% of the time, which hmm. is just huge. So yeah. my, my heart's working, you know, by itself now, which, which is what I wanted. You're still taking a very small amount of prednisone, right? Yeah. So after, when I, all this started, I, they had me at 20 megs and then yep. they stepped it down. I'm at 2.5 right now. Yep. And the, the, um, Mexotrexate, I'm on 15 uh, milligrams once a week. So, and that's considered, I, I know that's low, yeah, but it's, it's still a drug. I'm also, they, they throw in the, the alendronate and the, um, when I'm looking for the other drug I'm on, oh, folic acid. So the alendronate to try to help alleviate um, bone loss. And I mm -hmm. think the folic acid does something else to counter uh, one of the side effects of the methotrexate. So oh, okay. my SARC, doc actually who's one of the docs who's been on your podcast dr sporn he uh he's he's my doc and so wow uh, listening to your podcast just started connecting a bunch of dots for me i mean i think one of the podcasts you talked about you know what's the most important factor in dealing with sarcoidosis and i'm listening to this and i'm trying to guess and i like health and i was wrong it was zip code and i'm like okay i'm, I'm very very fortunate to be where I am. I'm, you know, one of the leading guys in SARC uh, research is here and yeah. he's my doc. So I, I got very lucky. And um, my cardiologists at Northwestern have been nothing but outstanding. And um, the guy that did the ablation was out of the University of Chicago, who was considered a leading expert in doing ablations. And I, I, I feel very fortunate. So I'm, I, I guess again, when I wrote you, I'm just like, Three years. Wow. And just, and I, I know a lot of this discussion on this is about 
the people that hits the most is the pulmonary people, but there's, there's a small, there's a small population of cardiac people out here too, that right. there's, there's additional level of complexity that goes into it. And even rarer is those of us who are neurosarc people. So um, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, it, it is a lot. So tell, let's, let's back up a little bit. Thank you for sharing the story of your incident. Um, but you mentioned your wife and your daughters and you are my age. So I'm assuming that, you know, your daughters are, are grown or nearly grown. So tell us about your family life. Yeah. So my wife and I, Next year, I'll be married 40 years. We okay. were high school, high school sweethearts. Um, I was a football player. She was a cheerleader. <laughs> oh, isn't that cute? You got me by a couple of years on the, on the marriage. I think we were on 38 this year. But yeah, go ahead. All right. And um, I, was, uh, I went to the Air Force Academy. So I was in the Air Force. And both daughters were born while uh, we were in the Air Force. So the oldest, uh, Christine, is... Uh, 35, the youngest, Madeline's 31, and Christine uh, is an occupational therapist, and she loves what she does, and she welcomed uh, a son into the world a year ago, so it's our first grandchild, and my daughter, Madeline, um, is in marketing, living downtown Chicago, having a blast, so Mm -hmm. Um, they've, it's been a lot of fun, uh, with the girls raising them. They're both uh, university of Iowa grads and they had a lot of fun there and learned a lot and they made a lot of friends. In fact, um, my wife's husband is also, uh, they, she met him at U- uh, university of Iowa. So, and they, uh, they live, um, both again, both of them live very close to us. So right. we're, we're, we're staying here for a while. <laughs> yeah. Your daughter's husband, I believe is. is yep. Yeah. Right. Um, well, that is, that's cool. Um, so it, you have, uh, so you, you've led an active life. You were a football player. Uh, the, the, I've got to talk a little bit about the bicycling and, and so forth, but uh, so you were riding 120 miles a week prior to this. And I consider myself a pretty avid cyclist, but for me, a hundred miles in a week is a week that I like put a star next to in my logs. Like this was a really good week. And you were doing that regularly. Yeah. That was several years ago when I was yeah. really just really into it. Um, and uh, my baseline is, is jogging. So that's mm-hmm. where I started and I've done four marathons, um, including the Boston marathon, which was a uh-huh. joy to joy to drew. A, Congrats. Do. Thank you. And, um, three of the four marathons I did under four hours, which was my goal. And so, um, I was training for was one marathon and I usually never signed up in advance because I didn't, if the weather was bad in Chicago, I didn't want to be running in, in nasty weather. And so I went to sign up the day before and they're like, nope, um, it's all full. I'm like, but I trained for a marathon. I'm ready to go. So someone then told me about triathlons and I swam in high school too. So I'm like, okay, okay. I can do the swimming part. So I got on a bike and it was one of these old <laughs> swim bikes and I realized, all right, I got to do something better than this. And so I started upgrading the bikes. And um, my very first triathlon I did was a half Ironman because I had trained for uh, a marathon. Right. And I'm like, I, I can do this stuff. And I'm like, after I did it, I'm like, oh, I can do a full Ironman. And my wife's like, uh-uh, not happening. <laughs> yeah. So, so a, full, a full Ironman, for people that don't know, is you start out with a two mile 2.4 mile swim i think and then and then you ride your bike 112 miles then you run a marathon correct all back to back to back correct yeah so i did a half version of that (laughs) but you did a half you did i mean so we host a a uh iron man event here in roanoke virginia where i live and it's a half and i just did the bike part last year uh, not as a part of the event, but just to do it. And of course here we live in the mountains. So it's, it's, it's very, it's a very difficult 50, uh, whatever it is, 50, uh, six mile ride. Yeah. 56. Right. Um, I can't imagine doing 
all those other things on either side of it. And yet lots and lots of people do. And then, or to double it. That's crazy. Yeah. That's just it, crazy. But it's something I really enjoyed. I just enjoy the feeling of being again, outside and in shape. So uh, again, that's part of the journey. I'm trying to, what's my new exercise, exercise normal. So last summer, um, I, I was only able to get 40 miles a, a week on the bike, which is just, I'm like, I'm, I think, I think I even wrote this to you. I'm pedaling, I'm pedaling. I'm like, I know I'm going fast. I look down the speedometer and I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> so the energy, and, and that's part of getting older too. I understand mm -hmm. that, but it just, right. just the energy seems, doesn't seem to be close to what I've expected on the trajectory of getting older. So, so now, so now the ablation that you had done, when was that? That was March of last year. So you're still basically recovering from that. Would you say? Um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm again, I look, I don't think so because I'm, it's a year out and I had no cardiac events. So should I start having cardiac events again? I then, then maybe I need to go back and get another one, but and I, I've heard there's been people that have to go back and get repeated ablations, but I think if I go back again, they're going to play with the external part of the heart because there's yeah. still the scarring there on that. But um, otherwise, I, I feel pretty good. I just so, so you're walking around feeling good, but your your fitness level hasn't returned to the fitness level that you had pre ablation pre sark. Not, no, not even close. Right. So and it may I can, not, it may it, not. Right. right. I will never run seven and a half miles every other day ever again. It just won't right. happen. Right. So I, I, I now do intervals. Mm -hmm. I was told that's even better for me. Um, so I get my heart rate to a certain point and then I walk until it gets to a certain point and I keep on bouncing up back and forth. Right. Cause again, I'm, I don't want this. <laughs> I don't want this device to fire. Um, you are, it seems to me like you're, you're right, living right on the edge. So you're doing intervals, which is where you run really hard and you watch your heart rate get jacked up. And then when it gets to a certain point, you walk until it comes back down and then you do it again. Yep. And then you walk till it comes back down. Then you do it again. And I've done this on the bike and I've done it running as well. Um, and, uh, the, the word when you're running is it's a, a Norwegian word fartlek. <laughs> which is not what it says. I think it's F A R T L E K fartlek. Um, and it's named after the guy that developed. So you're, you're doing that. So you're really pushing the boundaries, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get back to feeling fit. So I guess to answer your early question, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm better than where I was before the ablation, but I'm not pre cardiac event. So not even close. Yeah. So how have you reimagined your life now since you've had to go through sarcoidosis? Um, I, I, I think I take things more in stride now, maybe. Um, I, it just, everything I just look at, like, thank, just thankful for every moment I have now. Because again, I, I thought like that this could have been it. I can't tell you how many times my wife and I have been told that if I had not been in shape, no way. There's just no way I would have made it. So the fact that um, I, I just I just did a stress test and the nurse looked at my record and she's like, I've never seen anyone be in VTAC that long and come out of it okay. So um, I feel very blessed. So I I try to look at that. I do a lot of volunteer work. Um, I refocus my energies and doing volunteer work again with the skill set I have. It's very specialized. So I, I, I work with a group called Catch a Fire, which is um, basically a clearinghouse for nonprofits to find volunteers. So hmm. over the last three years, I've done about uh, over 90 projects with them, ranging from, you know, helping do mission, vision, value statements to Excel training, to doing data analysis, to doing all these different things. And I've met all these different nonprofits across the United States. I've actually worked with some guy in Australia, worked with a couple of folks in Africa. So I'm, it's, it, I really seem to be focusing more on that. Um, 
hoping to get to retirement <laughs> at right. some point. Right. Because I think that will keep my keep my mind active. Right. And when you go outside and so you ride your bicycle now uh, on the um, on the trails and paths around Chicago, trying to stay off the road so you don't have to fight with the cars. Right. So they, they converted rail line, old rail lines around here a long time ago. So there's a whole network. Uh, the one near me is called the Prairie Path and it's limestone paved. And mm. I just it's just a much safer ride. Um, back in my heyday, when I was really going at it, I would ride on the streets, but I'd usually drive a half hour west of where I am to get more towards the, uh, the countryside where there is less traffic. Yeah. I'm just, all it takes is one guy not paying attention and then you're, you're in a world of hurt. So yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I'm, I'm riding more and more off-road myself, but I, I still do get out on the roads. But we're very fortunate that you can be you can be rural very quickly when you're outside Roanoke, Virginia, as opposed to Chicago. Right, <laughs> we're, right. We're we're a, we're a small city. Um, Virginia's Blue Ridge is how we're we're now marketing this region. So, um, and you've got a grandchild. Yeah, I've, I've four years ago I had none. Now I have six. Holy cow! <laughs> so uh, grandchildren changed the way I look at life. Um, that's for sure. And I, I'm sure that that's the same for you. Uh, absolutely. Um, he's, he just turned one. And so I'm, uh, and I'm over, we've actually made our going over the last three weekends. So I'm like, we're looking around, it's snowing outside. Well, let's, let's see if our daughter wants a visitor. So we go over there, we, you know, we eat lunch and then we play for a couple hours until he's ready for a nap. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just it really refocus what's going on. And um, he's at an age where he's very active, like my oldest daughter was. And so I, it's like playing with my daughter again. He wants uh -huh. to fly around the room. And so it's just a lot of fun doing that. So it's the point now he start he recognizes me. And as soon as he sees me again, he wants to start, you know, flying around the room. So it's, it's a lot of fun, but yeah. I will tell you making that little kid fly around the room, I'm gassed after <laughs> it's over. Right. So uh, I think it's, again, that's part of dealing with how my body reacts to stuff now before I could do anything and it would just, it'd be fine. So. Yeah. It's uh, it's just, it's frustrating. You can't do what you once did, you know, and they, so they call sarcoidosis the snowflake disease because it impacts each of us differently. Um, I've also run the Boston Marathon and oh, congratulations. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, and I just always thought of myself as the guy that would always be fit and would always be healthier than, you know, a certain large percentage of the people walking around beside me. And I guess now I think I was arrogant to think that because sarcoidosis just just knocks you back a step, two steps, three steps. And it's it's hard to realize that, wow, you know, like playing with my grandchild tires me out. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, your form of it is much I think each form of it is so unique. And I was so lucky to have my aspect of it addressed through the ablation. So I, it's sort of like, but every time I go out, I am looking at that watch going, is my heart going to play nice today or not? So it's always in the back of your mind is what's going to happen. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it, to answer your, I think your earlier question, it's, it's, it's always, it's always there and, you know, being thought of. So your doctor, Dr. Sporn, said that your sarcoidosis is not active, but he described it as simmering. Can you tell us what that's? Cause I hadn't heard that before, but I think there are times when that's been my case. Right. So the last PET scan I had, um, he said, great news. The, there's no SARC activity in the heart. There's no SARC activity in the lungs, but as I look at your lymph nodes, they're glowing. Hmm. And he said, it's not active. So let's just call it simmering. It's there. And let's not mess 
with your current medication regime. Because ideally, they would love to taper you off, but I've had more than a few doctors tell me that if you let the SARC flare again as you taper your meds, it comes back with a vengeance. And I really don't want vengeance because vengeance in my case means I get more scarring on my heart. And then I got to rinse and repeat the medications, the ablation again. So if I have to live with the medication regime I live on right now, so be it. And I, I think I've heard a couple of people on your podcast say, I just, I just got to learn to live with what, what's being done. But in my choice with the cardiac meds, I had another alternative, which was the ablation. Yeah, right. But you don't want to have to do another ablation because every, every, I mean, even if that works, your heart will never be what it once was. I mean, they, they can, every time they do that, it hurts your heart a little bit more. Right. And every and, flare you get hurts your heart a little bit more permanently. And the, the phrase heart transplant has been used in front of me before. And that just, you know, scares me. And so I'm, I, I again, I, I don't want to ever get there, but I, it's, it's, it's out there and I'm, it's, so when they ever, they do an echocardiogram, they're trying they're looking at the ejection fraction. And I'm like borderline um, okay. And they're like, if it keeps on, if it drops to a certain point, then you got to, then the next consideration is, you know, you know, heart transplant. I'm like, let's not go there yet. <laughs> let's, let's see what we can do without before we get there. Right. So you get up in the morning and you, are, do you work from home? What, what do you do? Do you go to work? I'm, I'm in a hybrid schedule, so two days at home, three days um, um, at work, and the three days are downtown Chicago. So if you've ever been to Chicago, I the Blue Cross building is right across from Millennium Park. If you okay. ever went and saw the Bean, that's yeah, I can right. see that from my, my office. Wow. And so that's that's um, uh, the Metra, which is the commuter train. You take that in there. Then I, um, we actually have a bus that runs from the train station to the building, but I walk. I walk every time. So it's about a 25 minute walk. And I just, again, I like being outside. Yeah. I love the bean. The bean is so cool. It's this big, it's a, it's a sculpture that's shaped like a bean and it's about the size of a small house. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. And it's just, and you see a mirrored reflection, no matter where you walk around it or under it or whatever. Um, I, I love the bean. That's so cool. And so you're walking 25 um, minutes, three days a week and you're feeling fine, right? Yeah. And there and back. So I'm walking 50 total minutes. Um, and I'm, yeah, it's, it's feeling, feeling okay. Awesome. Awesome. And so you mentioned your relationship with God before we were talking and, and other people have brought that up. Have you become more or less religious or do you look at things in a more philosophical way now? I, I'm, I'm going to go towards no, but I, I also will say, I continued, I'm continuing my spiritual journey. I'm continuing to try to understand um, my, my faith in, in, in about that. So right now I'm reading something that's where there was a group of um, uh, priests that actually did a critical evaluation of uh, the four gospels, you know, trying to say, is this something that Jesus really would have said? And it's, it's really, really in depth. So I, I keep on exploring things. They might not be popular topics to talk about, but I'm just trying to explore my, my faith. And I, and I, and I, if you think about the volunteer work I do, it's about, you know, I think Christianity, a lot of it is about giving back, you know, mm -hmm. you know, giving. So that's, so yes, I've been doing more, more and more and more of that. Um, but I, I, it's, it's something I continue to explore and it's just, to me, it's, 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 it's fascinating. I think the, the underlying message of, 
uh, a Jesus, again, it's, is, 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 you know, love your neighbors. I mean, and, you know, love God above all else. Just, I think that's, that's a great message and it's hard to practice it sometimes loving your neighbors, but it's, it's great to aspire to that. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm really in, interested in understanding about that. Gotcha. Jack, is there anything else you want to add at this point? Um, so this is an aside. So after I, after I had this cardiac event, um, every year since 2001, I've gone on a canoe trip to, I, I don't know if you heard of Quetico. Yes, I've been there three times. Okay. So for the listeners, if you've heard of Boundary Waters in Minnesota, it's a place where there's no motorboats, it's canoes only. Quetico is the Canadian version of that. It is bigger in size and it they allow fewer people in. So I've been doing Quetico trips, eight day, seven night trips since 2001. And actually when 9-11 happened, we were in the field. It had 9-11, I think, what happened on a uh, Tuesday. And we were in the field. We had no idea. And when we came out of the field, we were told, um, you know, they like playing jokes on you to come back. Like there's something like the camp ran out of hot water. And the guy that picks us up says they 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 bombed the t- um the towers and the twin cities. I'm like, who's going to bomb Minneapolis, St. Paul. Right. Yeah. And so like, we thought it was a joke. We didn't believe it. And it would took a phone call home. And for my seven-year-old daughter at that time to say, yes, they bombed New York to, to, to make it real. And anyway, I go to, I go up to Quetico every year. And after this cardiac event, I said, I'm going. And my wife's like, you're not. I'm like, I'm going. And um, two, two months before the trip, I got a blood clot. So with this um, device, the ICD uh, pacemaker, they run wires through your veins down to your heart. And typically, if a blood clot shows, it shows up early but mine showed up late. So now I'm on blood thinners. And if you know about the Quetico, there is no 7-Eleven, there's no emergent care. You're, you're all by yourself. There's no so, communication. Correct. Unless you have a sat phone. A sat and, phone, right. Yeah. When we went, there were no cell phones, no walkie talkies, nothing. And so I'm like, I'm going even with this heart condition and, you know, my, my, my reaction to amiodarone and my, you know, the blood thinners I'm going, which is, you know, fairly not smart, probably dangerous. The month before I went, I'm mowing the grass and um, come in take a shower and I'm washing myself. I'm like, what's this? I had a hernia. And so I'm like, come on. <laughs> so I bought one of those girdles um that push it in so i went to quetico that year with you did yep with all that going on and my wife was not pleased but i'm like i gotta go this is this is sort of like my annual release so i thought you would appreciate that story it it goes back to what i need to be outside i really need quetico yeah that that's that's one of my bucket list things is to get back there. It's probably been, it's been over 20 years since I went, but I went three years in a row with, with a local group of guys and the fishing is the best fishing I've ever had in my life, but it's rigorous. Cause you, we would paddle, I think about 110 miles from where they dropped us off. Then we would sort of paddle back to a pickup point in a canoe and then you portage between the lakes. So you're carrying your canoe, you're carrying your backpack, you're looking out for bears. Um, and, and you just basically fished your way to the next campsite. Is that how you guys did it? Absolutely. And there's something, you know, 
people like, oh, it's, it's just canoeing. Well, no, the portaging is what kills people. So I, right. I brought a couple of newbies this year and the, the portages just kick their butt. <laughs> yeah. like, well, they can be a mile long. Right. I mean, some of these, some of them are very short. You hop for, there's 400 lakes within the Quitico wilderness. Right. And only, as I recall, only 200 of them even have names and the rest of them are just regarded as large puddles. They're not worthy, but you go from body of water to body of water to body of water. Um, and you follow your map and you, you're, I mean, and hope you don't get lost. I had some scary moments, but I can't believe you're able to do that with sarcoidosis. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still doing it and, uh, um, made it, made it through that trip. Okay. But I, this, that's what I, that's what I want to do. So, yeah. um, yeah. and you've talked about it, I think on your podcast several times about you, you got to get back to what, what feels right. Your body might not be hundred percent functioning the way you want it, but you got to get back to what you want to do is, is make, make the effort. So I, I just I keep on making the effort. Do you, um, do you do the carry the canoe yourself when it's your turn on the portage? Um, still this year I did. Yes. I just share a portage, the portage canoe. Cause I had a wow. solo canoe. I went with, and I did a solo, <laughs> I solo paddled cause I was with two other guys, two new guys, and I couldn't find a fourth. So I soloed. Okay. Call me. What month do you go typically? Uh, I typically go after Labor Day just because the, the mosquitoes are down. Ooh, um, okay. And that's a, that's a good time to go. And Again, if you're going back there at some point and you want a suggested route, I've been I've been through all the entry points in Quetico and I've I've hit most of the, the major paths. So I, I definitely have suggestions or tell you where it would be fun fun to go. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll have to talk. We'll start boring people really fast if we get into a <laughs> deep dive into this remote Canadian wilderness. <laughs> but um yeah, that is, I can't believe that I'm talking to somebody else who's actually been there because when I bring it up, everybody, they, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Sometimes boundary waters mean something to people, but right. But uh, Quitico, uh, you fly in in a float plane, they drop you off, and then, yeah, it's just, it's fantastic. I love it. Well, Jack, thank you so much. Good luck uh, at the Quitico this year. If you, are you planning to go in September again? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, I wish you all the luck in the world with uh, with fighting sarcoidosis and and uh, thanks for fighting the good fight. All right, thanks, and I appreciate you letting me tell my story. I feel like a zombie just feeding at stumbling. Jack wrote back to me after this interview saying he felt like he didn't fully answer one of my questions. And he says, uh, from all outward appearances, I have weathered the storm fairly well. And I'm writing, I'm reading to you from his email to me. He says, in fact, when my daughters visited me during my initial eight day stay in the hospital, they said I looked the same as always. And after leaving hospitalization, our friends and co-workers essentially made the same comment. And then he writes, but as you know, outward appearances can be deceiving. I seem to recall others that you have interviewed making this comment, and that's true. Jack continues, I am not the same. From the near-death experience to the reduced energy level, things are different. But I don't think I can ever adequately explain how a certain amount of wind has been knocked out of my sails. As a trivial example, when walking... The 25 minutes from the train station to work, I used to walk faster than everyone, no longer. My mind says I'm moving quickly, but I am now one of the slower persons out there. And Jack also sent a picture from the day after he was shocked. Uh, the medical term is cardioverted, and uh, I will put a picture of that in the show notes. It kind of shows the side of his body with the uh, with the wires and the shocking uh, element on there. But let me go back to what he said about walking slowly and having the wind knocked out of his sails. That is just so true. That is that is totally my experience. Uh, I'm teaching a course this semester in podcasting at Radford University, and I walk about uh, only about a half a mile 
from my parking space to the building in which I teach. And the students are, I, I think, all right, I'm walking. I'm doing a half a mile today. Well, the students, other faculty members, they all walk right by me on the sidewalk. And here I think, oh, I'm walking pretty well, but it's just not the same, you know. And here I am, as Jack was, you know, somebody who's kind of used to being at, at or near the front of the pack. And it just, it just really, it really gets to you. But You know, I got to give Jack credit because he's still walking that 25 minutes. And remember what his doctor told him about if you weren't fit, if he wasn't fit, he would not have succeeded as well as he did. And he might not have even survived. So I think there's something to there's something to being fit. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, And I've talked to any number of people here on the podcast who at the moment they learned that something was wrong with their body, they were doing something fitness related. Well, one person, and I'm sorry, the name escapes me off the top of my head, but one person was hiking in the Grand Canyon on a three day trip with his daughter. Um, other people uh, have had similar situations where all of a sudden something didn't seem right, skiing, uh, all these different things. And this past weekend, uh, we had the, uh, and this is all very top of mind because we had the We have the Foot Levelers Blue Ridge Marathon here in Roanoke, and it's the hardest marathon in the United States. And I was involved in the creation of this marathon, and I've never run it, uh, but I do the announcing at the start line and the finish line. And I'm seeing all these people going out and, and basically completing the hardest road marathon in the United States, and I'm just so... Uh, I'm so energized by their energy and their effort, and it just stinks that to me I'll never be able to go out and and give that a try. Um, but uh, so uh, again, just just kind of thoughts that parallel the things that that Jack is saying, and, you know. And it's important to remember the part about not looking different. And if you follow Sark patients on Instagram, if you listen to this podcast, it's full of people quoting others saying, yeah, but you don't look sick. And honestly, if you're not on prednisone, that's often true. If you're taking high doses of prednisone and your face all swells up and your body in the back of your neck and your gut, your weight gain and so forth, then yeah, you actually do look different. But if you're not, you're suffering. You've got all these things going on with you and, and people just don't get it. And they still expect you to be your old self and you can't be. Um, and that's that's just a bummer. But I do want to say congrats to Jack for, for taking that risk with his surgery and saying he was going to get as much out of his life as he could and get back to being as normal as he could and getting off of the drugs to the extent that he could that were causing so many side effects. So let's let's hope he stays out there in the Quetico uh, every year and keeping his streak going, paddling, fishing, and portaging. And if you don't understand portaging, that's where you put the canoe on your back, on your shoulders, and then you carry it over difficult terrain and you go from lake to lake to lake. And some of these portages are up to a mile in order to get to the next lake and to continue your journey. And I can still remember from 20 years ago how how difficult that is. And Jack was out there doing it even after sarcoidosis. So kudos to him. A reminder, the official Sark Fighter song called Zombie is by Mark Steyer, a fellow Sark Fighter who plays in a band called the White Hot Lizards in Alberta, Canada. You can hear his story, the story behind the lyrics, in episode 12. Uh, I call this the Sark Fighter podcast because I'm fighting Sark and so are you, whether you're a caregiver, a patient, a researcher, no matter which way you come at this disease. Uh, It's a place where we all gather so you don't feel like you're all alone. And I want you to know that there is a reason for hope because even though Jack's story is sad at some levels, there's a reason to hope because he's kept on fighting and he's found a way to get it done. I release this podcast every other Monday. And as I am speaking today, I'm looking over and my trusty dog, Dougal, my boxer, who is a rescue, is curled up Uh, He's curled up on the chair in my office, and Dougal makes my life so much better. 
Don't forget to go back and listen to the three bonus episodes on SARC and COVID, another bonus episode on dealing with prednisone, as well as the most recent bonus episode talking about the universal barriers that we all face with sarcoidosis, but how it's even more difficult for some people, depending upon their background, where they live, and uh, and we kind of delve into how zip code might be the most important thing. Jack actually referenced this in uh, in his interview, uh, how zip code might be the most critical thing in terms of how you do or don't get care and find solutions for your sarcoidosis. There are rare opportunities as all the right people come together in these bonus episodes all in one place at the same time. And thanks to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research for organizing that and getting those people in the right place and then really giving me the opportunity to moderate and to help tell the story of sarcoidosis even better. If you are new here, you're just trying to figure out what sarcoidosis is, go back and listen to episode two with Dr. Simon Hart. That's one of our most listened to episodes. That is Sarcoidosis 101. If you want to know my backstory, that's episode one. The backstory to the founding of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is episode 11 with Andrea and Redding Wilson, who started this at their kitchen table. Please send me an email. It's in the show notes, carlinagency at gmail.com. Follow The Sark Fighter on Instagram and Sark Fighter on Facebook. Let's make sure we get out there and make everybody know about sarcoidosis during April, Sarcoidosis Awareness Month. I appreciate your interest in the Sark Fighter podcast. If you like it, just share it with one person one other person that will help grow the show and help me be effective in spreading the word about sarcoidosis. Thanks again to Jack Bepley for joining me here today. I wish him all the best. Maybe sometime Jack and I'll go fishing. Till next time, keep fighting. Learn to suffer, you feel your pain someday. Learn endurance, your strength will fade away. Dead man walking, trying to keep up the pace, dead man